Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Heart Health Focus Week. And we are going to cover a lot of topics throughout the week. But today, kitty cat people, it is your day. Because today my guest is Amaya. And she owns Felvet in um, Spain. You're in Spain? Yeah, Mallorca. Okay. So she is a veterinary surgeon certified in feline medicine, has a, is a master in veterinary nutrition and president of the Raw Feeding Veterinary Society. Just a couple little things on your plate. Um, <laughs> and I love, we took this description off your website. It is so cool. Despite being a feline veterinarian with many years of experience, as a young girl, I really didn't like cats. <laughs> <laughs> As a young girl, I always wanted a cat and I wasn't allowed to have one because my father didn't like cats. So I got my first cat uh, the day I came home from my honeymoon, which was a year after I graduated from vet school. So yeah. I was it's very late. Me, yeah. very late. <laughs> yeah. um, but Dr. Amaya discovered that she had a special connection with animals and cat cats helped her find her true self, which is awesome. Uh, she says, on my path as a veterinarian and artist, I discovered that there is also art in science, which is very, very true, um, in every cat and in every diagnosis. We just have to stop and listen before we take action. This translates into a unique and holistic approach to feline health and wellness that goes beyond conventional medicine. And that is so, so, so true. Because um, I, I used to say in practice, if I was having a bad day, Day, when you're doing things like acupuncture and chiropractic, they're, they're energy therapies. And if if your energy is not in a good place, treatments really don't go very well. <laughs> yes. and, and actually, that I had some experience with that because I've been helping some of my friends that are holistic, that they have their own clinic. And sometimes the stress of the timings of a clinic doesn't allow you to be on that Zen moment that you need to, <laughs> to get. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, so you are now doing second opinion consultations for, are you just for cats? Yes. Okay. Just for cats. So if you're the person that people are coming to for a second opinion, that means they've already had at least one first opinion and they're either not getting the results that they want or there's some confusion around that or they're looking to do things differently. Um, yes. And we want to focus on heart disease in kitty cats. So what are the types of heart disease that you do consultations with or that, you know, what are you hearing the most about that people have problems with? Well, the biggest one, and, and I think it's the most frequent as well, is the hypertrophy uh, cardiomyopathy, which is because it's sometimes it, it is tricky to diagnose, especially if the vet is not too into uh, feline medicine. It's something that it is written everywhere that, you know, the, the heart grows from the inside more than from the outside. But we are so used to looking at the dilate cardiomyopathy that we are expected to see, you know, something big and something a huge in a, in our, in a X-ray. And sometimes that's, you know, sometimes you see normal size, yeah. but from the inside it's, it's concentric. It's, it's growing from the inside. And this is quite challenging because what most, many, many times when I was practicing before, I noticed that some uh, vets were kind of, um, uh, like didn't know what to do when they found already thrombosis on, on, you know, lack of sensitivity on their backs. And, you know, they were looking at the heart and, you know, from an x-ray many years right. ago only. And then, you know, they were like, okay, I, I can't find it. And I, I was like always reminding them that, remember the cats are different. This is something, you know, my teacher told me, remember always cats are going to be different. <laughs> yes. They're, they are not small dogs. And so the big yeah. problem, I think that most heart disease in cats is discovered when they're in crisis because most of them that have heart disease don't even have a murmur. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. on an x-ray, the heart looks normal size. So I had my second cat that I got. My first one was P and the second one was PS. <laughs> and PS was 12 years old. 
And he went, he used to sleep with my daughter. She was two at the time. And we were reading bedtime stories and PS got off the bed and went down two flights of stairs to go use the litter box. And he didn't come back up. And that was because he always slept with her. So it was a very unusual thing for him not to come back. So we finished books and I said, all right, I'm going to go find your cat. Went down the stairs and he was, uh, he was about halfway back up the stairs dead. And on autopsy, he had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and I had no clue. He had zero symptoms, zero murmur. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of times that's how we find out that these cats have heart disease because yeah. cats are pretty good at hiding their symptoms. Totally. Yeah, totally. And well, I did have some cases now that I, you, it reminded me to, um, that I had sudden deaths like that, like, and nobody, you know, sometimes it's difficult to get a, an autopsy afterwards, but here in Spain, especially, I don't know, other, uh, elsewhere, but um, probably it was that, it was the same thing, because he, he wasn't showing any other symptom, no, I mean, tolerance to exercise, you don't see them outside, you don't get to, you know, a, unless they are zooming around, and then, you know, they get tired, sometimes it's normal, even if they, if they are panting afterwards, Right. So right. you are not this is not something logical. They are not going to be coughing normally. Maybe right. maybe you will get probably you will find it whether they have pure effusion or they have or if you suspect something. For example, my cat had kidney disease. Uh, she was before it was really hard to transition her to raw. So she had a lot of years of, of processed foods, but then she got kidney disease and uh, and she, her gums were already affected as well. So this made me think and say, maybe we should check the heart as well. But she didn't ha have uh, hypertension. She didn't have any other symptoms. I just, you know, I just simply wanted to see if the kidneys and the gums were affected, well, maybe the heart is too, right? It's like, <laughs> but just yeah. because, and it was, and actually she had a little, She was. it wasn't a uh, massive um, hypertrophy, but still it was, you know, it, it was starting, but nothing, you couldn't see anything at all. This is, wow. this is very important for people to know if you have gingivitis, if you're a cat with gingivitis, have, certain uh, prevention, you know, preventative controls, trying to search for the biomarkers of the heart and, you know, just keep it, you know, keep it control so you don't get that issue. Because once you have other diseases such as kidney disease or, or uh, hyperthyroidism as well, those are things that are going to make it worse. And this is when you're going to see the heart disease, right? So that's a very interesting connection. And so when you get someone who contacts you, I mean, do people ever contact you specifically about a heart disease problem? Well, n it's never one thing when they contact no, Right, exactly. <laughs> Usually it's connected with all those things. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, so what changes are you telling people to make if, if they've got a cat who's got some kidney disease, got some heart disease going on or some gingivitis going on? What, what are your first recommendations that you tell these people need to happen? Well, the, the, the biggest thing that I always go for is first a good diagnosis. Because sometimes you, they don't, you know, they suspect there is a heart issue, uh, or maybe they are already with some medications that are not the best option. So, first of all, I go through, you know, a check, a complete checkup of the uh, conventional medicine, because you know you need that if the if the mm -hmm. disease is already settled, right? But then what I look is into nutrition. That's my biggest point. But it's specifically for heart disease is uh, going to be the taurine, L-carnitine, and, um, and omega-3. That's kind of my basic three for heart disease. Then we can explore different herbal. Uh, I, I'm very careful. I, I really love, for example, mushroom therapy. But I'm mm -hmm. very careful in with heart disease just because of the medication they get. So, you know, I try to look into other options, see if we can reduce 
the the amount of drugs mostly you know when they come to me they that's not possible but we try <laughs> mm. and nutrition is the main fo- focus at that time if it's possible because i don't want to stress the cat as well right yeah, yeah cats can t- it takes so long to get them to transition my my longest one was 6 months to yeah, get her moved too. over it's kind of- <laughs> So life is so much easier now because my cats that I have now have never seen a piece of kibble and they are not ever going to see a piece of kibble. Um, So it's so much easier when you start them out on that high moisture, fresh diet. So do you find for, so for cats that just say, "Mm, no way, I'm not going to do that. I'm so addicted to this kibble. um, Would, do you normally then ask the client to supplement with taurine and l-carnitine yeah well instead. they're in processed foods usually i have my cats are <laughs> zooming around <laughs> hold on <laughs> there you go <laughs> they want to get back in uh, behind the computer and that's a mess if they Ow. do <laughs> i don't want that <laughs> cats are uh, so much fun yeah uh okay so supplements uh yeah but it's not all going to be just taurine or just because i'm going to find all the other deficiencies i'm going to try to find good gut health which sometimes it's not uh well what i've been finding lately is that everything connects to the gut in the end right so yes <laughs> It's, it's impossible to, to escape from it. So if they are already in ultra processed foods, I'm going to add some other natural anti-inflammatories to make right. sure, because omega-3s is going to, you know, they're going to be like crazy trying to get everywhere and, and, and be helpful. So probably I'll be adding other anti-inflammatories, natural ones, um, right. that are going to help the body to cope with the kibble and the other things. But I will make a really good effort to keep them at least on wet food because one of the things that uh, I've experienced with all the chronic diseases and all these things that I've been working with, uh, it's that it has to be wet. You know, it has to be. I mean, I'm sorry if you can, if you like if they are addicted, you have to try. At least to get it into uh, a canned food that I'm not going to like, probably, uh, most canned food either. But I would rather, (laughs) if I have to choose, I will rather have wet food. That that makes... That makes it much better to supplement, makes it much better to yeah. uh, to give the um, the necessarily amount of water because you have to be very careful with the heart disease to uh, give fluids. Right. You have to maintain a balance there as well. So. Right. So when we have these cats who are in kidney failure, so they need to be on sub Q fluids, and then they've also got some heart exactly. disease, and we have to be very careful with the fluids. It, it is a mess. It's such, and you have to- it's a balancing act. Yeah. So, um, do you do you feel that? So we have these cats that say, "I'm not switching. You can't make me." And we want to get things like L tor uh, L carnitine and taurine in them. Do you feel like that's absorbed as well as a natural meat source? <laughs> that we that if we could get them to eat it no it's not gonna be for me no i mean all that it's inflamed then i i have many cats supplemented for, for example with vitamin b's which is pretty common and they don't mm-hmm. the absorption it's really reduced when they are not when they when they're inflamed by you know probably right. processed food so i i would make the same assumption to all other supplements at it's not like maybe more or less. It's that you don't know everything. For yeah. me, it's much better dissolve if it, if the if the it it has its own water content. If it is with the mo- the moisture of the food and not with water that they have to drink afterwards because they are thirsty. You know, it is completely different the how they will absorb those nutrients. So I will apply that for everything. Do you ever um, find that you see any reversal? of the disease when we get them on a species appropriate diet and supplements? Well, the, the, when I get the case, usually no, because the, when they are already chronic and as a second opinion vet, usually they are already, <laughs> you know, in a, in a poorly state. But what, what, what I found is that uh, they are stabilized in a way that, you know, they, they don't have to go so often to the vet. They, they you know, they, 
we can keep it because most most uh, guardians what they are going to choose is uh, they are so tired of you know stressing the cat and taking it to the vet for all all controls that sometimes they're going to tell you well just you know do the best you can and see what happens. And uh, what I try to do is have a certain control that they, you know, teach them how to, I don't know, get a urine sample so they have a certain control of what's going on, reducing the amount of time there, the, the, the times they go to the vet. And this, this I can manage. This is because so they are right. stabilized for a longer period of time. And this is good. This is something we, we are looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Stress plays such a huge role in the inflammation and blood pressure and heart disease. And um, I read something not too long ago that um, studies show that I forget, it was like 80 or 90% of indoor cats have very high stress levels. And I don't remember which, whether they were measuring cortisol or which biomarkers they were using for that. But um, it makes perfect sense because so many of us, you know, we have a cat, they live in an apartment and we're like, yeah, she sleeps on the sofa all day. It's all good. And we forget that they mm -hmm. really need that, that interaction, the ability to climb. They need that vertical space. They need uh, the ability to hunt and pounce and stalk and win. <laughs> and uh, well, and that's the thing. I mean, we have good cat owners who are like, oh, great. I'll play laser tag with them. But then yeah. at the end, the cat doesn't win anything. And yes. they're like, yeah. <laughs> like the mouse the disappeared. That's the point. Of yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I think that's a, um, that's very true. And not, not having to put them in the carrier and yeah. take them to the veterinary office as often is and, really huge and most people don't practice stress. most people don't practice this is something i encourage there is something you said very interesting about they they live indoor and we assume that they are okay but i always tell people that they have to understand that's not the natural environment so uh just compare ourselves when we were in a pandemic that we had to be inside how we felt yes we adapt mm. Yes, we feel safer because we are afraid of what's going on outside. There might be dangers outside. But in the end, it is we are social beings. So in the end, and, and cats are social. They are independent, but they are social. So we have to understand that, yes, they are sacrificing in a way a little bit of their liberties and independence for this safety thing. And it's okay. Yes, but you have to be aware that all your energy, how you feel, how you enrich the home, how everything around it, the way you play, the way you interact with your cat, you know, it has to, you have to keep that in mind every time you make a change. Because for me, it's not true that cats don't adapt to change. They, it's like we make changes without thinking on them. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and we are very big and, you know, we move fast and we, we are running around very automatically working. And so I think cats are misunder misunderstood in this, uh, in this sense. So we have to look into this, especially when they are already suffering for, for, for heart disease or kidney disease, because there is no single disease in cats that I can say it's just this organ. <laughs> Usually, you know, yeah. <laughs> it comes around. But inflammation, it is something that we don't look at it very well. Um, we don't care. It's like we assume it's okay. It's normal because we are inflamed as well. Um, as well as, for example, hyper, uh, hypertension. It's really difficult to have a really good measure of, of blood pressure in cats. Because, you know, you have to take yeah. the vet, they have to be calm. They, you have, as a vet, when I was practicing, I, I said, uh, you have to become sent in your own clinic to actually be able to manage your cat. To, so what I recommend in the stress side of things is that you practice for things. You practice interaction with your cat, practice to use the, the, the um, uh, how do you call it? The, the, carrier, the, the carrier. The carrier. And uh, and practice to play just to get them in. I, I sometimes use boxes. You know, they just put a box. I just close it and then open the lids again. And I was like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you make it a funny thing instead of waiting until you have to go. Because heart disease is going to 
ask you to check and recheck and, you know, have an, an, an electrocardiogram. And there are things that cats don't have to understand. They're going to be in the clinic. They're going to be listening to things that you don't perceive, but they do. Uh, there smells that we smell. don't perceive that they do. Exactly. So just try to make it better. It's like, it's not going to be easy because sometimes you adopt a cat that had so many traumas that, you know, you do what you can, but, <laughs> but if you can, yeah. there are simple things that you can try every day practicing as a playtime instead of, for example, using the laser tag and, uh, and just because it's easy for you, you can do it from the from the couch, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, behavior is so, part of this. <laughs> um, so you and I were talking before we went live, and you mentioned something, and I and I want to talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, so when I was in practice uh, before I retired from clinical practice. When we would do echocardiograms or abdominal ultrasounds, so an echo is just a heart ultrasound, we always did them with the animals awake and just lying on their side. And the same with our EKGs. And now when I want to get an ultrasound or an echo on one of my animals, the clinicians are insisting that they be heavily sedated to have those procedures done. And in my mind, one, I don't think with a sedated animal where you've got anesthesia on board, I don't think you're seeing the true heart function because you're changing their, their fluid load, their, their, their heart volume, how it's contracted. Like you're changing so much. How are you getting an accurate echo or frankly, even an EKG when you've got a bunch of drugs on board um, and, you know, the putting them on their back to do things just seems wrong because I we always did everything on their sides. Yeah. So can you can you talk to how that what you're seeing being done and uh, how we can change that? Well, yeah, actually, for me, it was, you know, you, you're not aware sometimes of what it's what can be improved until you watch something new and say, Oh my God, what I've been doing so far. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this, this actually was kind of a, um, a moment there. Um, uh, I, I was, you know, was, my cat was kind of suffering that and every, every single vet wanted to do a echocardiogram, just sedating her. She wasn't an easy cat, but I knew how to handle and this is something, you know, I didn't have this conversation. The vet did never ask me how, you know, this relationship, if I could handle my cat, because some people can't, that's, that's a, something, right? Okay. True. It, it is possible, but I could. And I said, I don't want to sedate my cat because she has so many problems and she's not, you know, she's not easy uh, to sedate. She's very nervous. She's not going to be easy to manage. And, and he said, oh yes, but this is the way we do it. I know. But you know me, I'm a vet and I, I don't want you to do that. So if you have to have this conversation, I, I just put I put into the shoes of, of a normal guardian. And this is something you, you know, you don't know what to do at that time. But most people actually contact me when they are asked to sedate their cat. <laughs> because it's like, uh, what should I do? And, you know, you have to evaluate the risk because, you know, what, what are we going to do? And then, uh, so most of the time it is heavily sedated. And then, well, and also sedating cats, it's kind of been a norm now as a as something good for the cat so he doesn't get stressed, which for me is so crazy. <laughs> Just to think. <laughs> <laughs> I know I get that question all the time. My vet wants me to give gabapentin to my cat. So but before I bring him in, I'm like, ah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Even I, I mean, I went through this argument. One of my dogs who has um, pretty significant heart disease, his murmurs like a grade five and he's a, he's a spaniel. So yeah. of course he's got mitral valve disease and we were looking for cancer in his bladder. So I needed an ultrasound to his abdomen. And when I took him in, the veterinarian absolutely refused to do it without sedation. And I said, then I'm leaving. And so wow. I walked back out the door. I said, I, I, and the, the veterinarian who was supposed to be doing the ultrasound wouldn't even come out and talk to me. He kept sending the technician 
back and forth. And she's like, no, he, he says he won't do it with that. I'm like, you go tell him why I'm doing this and this heart disease, blah, blah, blah. She kept coming back and going, nope, he's, he won't change his mind. And I said, well, then I'm going home. And so I had to call a bunch of other practices and I finally found one and they said, well, we always sedate. And I said, no, you, you can't sedate. And they said, well, bring him in. We'll evaluate him and we'll make a decision. And I said, okay. And if your decision is that you're going to sedate, then I'm walking back out the door. And they said, that's fine. And I said, I'll even pay you the full cost of the ultrasound if I walk out the door, if that's what it requires. And so they were fine. And when we went in, they listened to his heart and they went, oh, we're not sedating this dog. We're going, exactly. No. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thank Thankfully, somebody with a little bit of common yeah. sense and, you know, he was great for his ultrasound. They were kind of funny. They didn't let me in the room to hold him. Their room was very, very small. They didn't have room for another person. So I was like, all right, whatever. Um, but I was right outside the door. And uh, when they came out and they had finished everything, they said, well, the only problem we had was he would shake once in a while. And I'm like, well, he's a little nervous. <laughs> but he was, you know, he was an angel and I knew he would be fine. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like the changes that we're seeing in the profession where I know it makes it easier and quicker, yeah. maybe for the people handling the animals, but I, I think we need to look at but there, what is best yeah, for the exactly. animals. Yeah, <laughs> and there are so many risks if you do that. Uh, but this is why uh, sometimes I question what it's called being a friendly clinic for cats, because usually this is what they do, uh, trying to make it faster and you know efficient. But I think what cats want is empathy and time, yeah. right? So it's completely yeah. the opposite. And what I found yeah. very interesting about this heart, heart disease is that when they were, now they are doing uh, electrocardiogram, uh, they're teaching, I don't know if this is going to be very uh, uh, easily in every practice right now, but uh, they are now showing how to do it on a sphinx position, like, you know, sitting up straight. And they're mm -hmm. teaching now to elevate the cat into kind of a, a small table on top of your table and then just put it there with a hole where the heart is. And they are changing now the way they are showing the images. So you learn how to uh, diagnose a cat by putting the image from ventral, right? So from the, ah, yeah. So, from underneath. From underneath. And, and uh, it was really, uh, it was really interesting because the cardi cardiologist of the webinar, this was in ISFM, uh, was really, you know, saying you see the images change, so you have to make adapt from what you are used to right. from from this point of view. And I was like, "Wow, you can do that!" I was like, you know, it was a really good moment for me. I'm not gonna do it, but at least I know. So when people ask me, I can say, "Hey, find a cardiologist that does it," and if not, tell him about ISFM yeah. and tell him, you know, that he should check on that, and you know. I mean, think about how much more comfortable it is for the cat to just lay there in their normal position versus being flipped over on their back and, you know, having people poking and prodding. I mean, talk about being in a uh, submissive posture that, you know, it's like, oh, my gosh. And then all these big enemies that I don't know are coming at me to do things. I would think <laughs> I would think our electrocardiograms when we're doing it that way are probably no. not <laughs> <laughs> you have to make it's like oh look at that his blood pressure is 300 and his heart rate is 300 and it's all over the place yeah. yeah i think i think you're right i think it's um just being more empathetic to what we're and interesting i went i was in vet school a long long time ago i i did go with the dinosaurs um but i will never forget our medicine professor said in one of our very first lectures, he said, you know, I'm going to teach you all these different procedures and tests and things that you should be doing on your patients. And he said, what I would say to you is every procedure that you want to do on your patients, you should have to undergo at least once so that you will have that empathy. And so this was a male professor and he was talking about urinary catheterization. Mm -hmm. And he said, every one of you should undergo that and you will think a lot differently when you're handling your patients. And, uh, you know, it goes for, for everything. Like I, <laughs> I wanted to get an EKG on myself once in the office. Yeah. And so I used the little alligator clips that we use on the animals. Oh my, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> they hurt. 
you know, and then we wonder why the animals are like, yeah. ah! you know, <laughs> like they don't understand where they are. And suddenly you're poking them with it. <laughs> Right. You're, you're pinching them for all their worth. So in multiple places. So I think, I think it's, it's really, it's really true that we do have to really think about about it from the, um, from the cat's point of view. I've seen some uh, really, you know, they're funny when we look at them, but, you know, veterinary technicians who have done videos where they take one of the tacks and they put them in a box and they close it all up and then they rattle oh, yeah. it and shake it and rock it, you know, and then lots of noise. And then, you know, when, when they're done with that, then they pop it open and drag them out. And it's like, that's exactly what we do to yes, our cats. Exactly. And they have no mm-hmm. clue. Like they're so like, where am I going? Yeah. And they, they don't have to understand. They don't, you know, we can, we can, uh, we have to stop thinking. And this is the same thing as a guardian. You have to uh, stop thinking about what you think the cat is uh, needing or because you're going to, you're going to put your needs first. So try to think of how they live outside and how, you know, they're predators. They have different, a different perspective, which by the way, it's something we should learn <laughs> from them. <laughs> the way they, they yeah. perceive life and, you know, they are always looking for feeling comfortable and on all these things. But we need, we need to understand this. We need to find that empathy as guardians. So when you, you make that, uh, trouble from, from your house to the vet, you're already helping. Then, you can choose a vet that it's more appropriate. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, but there you go. You know, you just try to find an em- empathetic uh, vet. And then you have the right to tell the vet if you're doing something or not. If something does not convince you, this is something that happens a lot, a lot here in Spain. They are not, they don't dare to question their vet. Uh, and I have a, a friend of he's a conventional vet, and I uh, we have really good good communication. Every time it's nutrition, he goes like, "Just talk to her." <laughs> <laughs> Don't, awesome. I'm not gonna get into that. <laughs> so, but every time he got well, sometimes I I went to visit, and he said, "You know, all your clients are so difficult." <laughs> 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 yeah, I think I've, I've uh, ticked off a lot of veterinarians by making their clients difficult yeah. too. And it's just really just being able to have conversations exactly. and ask questions and um, and not be shut down when you ask questions and, you know, thought that you're crazy just because you'd like to know what the side effects of the medication are. Uh, <laughs> you know, you'd like to know why we have to give this prescription diet. Like, is there something else I could do that might be a little different or a little better? Um, so yes, I, I totally encourage people to ask questions and I, I understand that it does make some veterinarians <laughs> a little crazy. And, you know, part of it is they're just always rushed. Yes. Um, yes. And, and so if they, you know, if you have that client who wants to stand there and have a half hour conversation and you have five minutes, it's, but that's not the best, um, that's not the best scenario for a cat anyway, because no. cats don't like to be rushed. That's, um, it was really interesting when I, when I opened my second, when I opened my second clinic, um, somebody came in, you know, a new client came in with a cat. And so soon as she came in, she sat the carrier down in the exam room. She sat in the chair and my technician went over and opened the carrier and just left the door open. And we just, you know, waited for the cat to come out and the cat jumped up on the window seat, was sitting in the sun, you know, taking a bath. And the client flew out of her chair and said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I know they're not allowed out of the carrier and I'll put the cat back. I'm like, what are you talking about? The veterinarian down the street from us never took a cat out of a carrier. So the exam, if they got one was in the carrier with him just reaching in and then he would just reach in and jab them with whatever. And the cats were not allowed out of their carrier. So I'm like, how is that good veterinary medicine? How do you do a good exam with a cat? Especially with a cat that you need to touch and, you know, you have to take some time there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So the the poor client, she was so wigged out because we had her cat out just walking around the room and sitting, jumping up on the window seat. And I'm like, 
cat's having a good time. Just leave the cat alone. <laughs> so that's what you want to look for. You want to look for, you know, something, uh, you know, where the cat can feel a little more comfortable, where there might be a soft perch that they can sit on for a minute and check out their surroundings yeah. and not be in such a rush. I think that, you know, the dragging the cat out of the box and forcefully and then immediately diving in, we really do a disservice. Yeah. To kids. And make sure that as, as well to have those uh, carriers that can be, you know, broken, broken, broken from, from the, the top. top or some, you know, different ways. Well, yeah. And that's not so bad. If you have one that you're opening from the top and the cat's hunkered down in there and they feel comfortable, yeah. fine. You can, you can get in there and do a lot of things, but the, these, you know, front yeah. load carriers. And it's so dangerous. You can't, for me, like, you, can't you can't do a good exam and you can't, I mean, And oh I don't see gosh. a safe so, either. So anyway, <laughs> I think I think I think that vet really did not like cats at all. And so he would have preferred never never to see or touch a cat. And so for the most part he didn't. <laughs> and this is the thing. I I, I I usually work with many vets as long as they are open. Because you know, being rushed as a vet, it's kind of the normal thing. In it's sad. Yes. It's sad because I know they they're frustrated as well. Most of my friends are. Mm -hmm. And uh yeah. so the good thing about the second opinion is that If they allow me, we can work as a team because I need them to to see what yeah, I want absolutely. them to see. What I you know, and and it's good to have someone. If you are open and humble, you can you can say, hey, uh, you know, I, I read a study because I have the time because I, I take time for every single patient. You know, I can give you this information and we can share what he sees on the practice on the you know those 15 minutes that they get if they get that 15 minutes. Right. <laughs> and on the other hand, I can be the other vet that looks on the, you know, the details or, you know, so right. I think collaboration is something that we need to start doing more and more. And it's quite hard for many Absolutely. vets. Yeah. It is. It is. And, you know, I don't know whether um, people just feel threatened or don't want to be questioned or just, literally don't have mm. the time. Um, but well, I appreciate everything that you're doing and, you know, being president of the raw feeding society, I'm sure it takes a little bit of time. Um, and then also your consultations and being busy with research and studying and very, very cool. So thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me. And, um, so you do, uh, with the, with the raw pet medics, yeah. which is Dr. Um, Brendan Clark, Nick. Yeah. Yeah. And Nick, Thompson, no, Nick right? is on the Nick is not a fan of of cats. He sends he sends oh, them to me. <laughs> he's not the cat person. Gotcha, gotcha. So, um, but is it once a month on Friday mornings? Uh, yeah, on Fridays is, uh, that you do the cat it's thing. One p.m. Uh, UK time. It's once a month. Next one, I think, is on the twenty third of February. And yeah, okay. we usually you know grab different the next topic i can't remember right now uh i think it's the flu we're going to discuss um yeah oh, cool. so Yeah, so we actually stream yeah. your that show on on our page as well. So we do have uh, cat specific content for our kitty mm -hmm. people, um, and I think they really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much for spending time with me today. I really appreciate it taking time out of your busy schedule. <laughs> thank you for keep working on those. Thank kitty you cats. for inviting me as well because <laughs> <laughs> it's good to talk to you. No problem. <laughs>